is a house of praise. Let's lift him up. Sing it. Turn to you. God who saves us. He's God who's powerful enough to save so that we can stand here and sing as the body of Christ. Death was arrested and new life, new life begins.
Lift him up, church. This morning, as we begin our prayer time, we want to begin with a very familiar verse as we meditate on that this morning, John chapter 15, verse 5, as it leads into what we've been talking about in our series, The Centered Life. And we see in this passage of Scripture, Jesus speaking and John recording the words when he says, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. And so as Jesus is speaking there, he is telling us that he is the vine. He is the source of all life. He is the source of every good gift. And he invites us this morning to be the branches. As long as those branches are connected to that vine, connected to that tree, those branches have life as well just like the tree. And so this morning, Jesus is inviting us to abide in him, to know him this morning. So let's begin praying. Father, this morning we are grateful that you are the vine and you are the tree. Father, you are the one who is the source of life. You are the one who holds all things in your hand. Father, we thank you that you are steadfast, that you are true. Father, that you never change. And God, this morning, you invite us to know you, to abide in you. Father, our prayer is to know you and to be with you. And this morning, we're thankful, Lord, that you've offered that invitation to us. But Jesus goes on here in this passage here, and he, and he not only tells us that he is the vine and that we are the branches, but he says, apart from him, we can do nothing. Apart from him, there is no fruit that is bared. And so I know that as we come here this morning, we bring all types of things into this room. We bring all types of problems and struggles and trials that are in our life. And, and this morning, we want solutions. We want fruit out of those things. Jesus says, if you abide in me, fruit you'll bear. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Father, this morning we are grateful that even in the midst of our struggles, God, that you are still bearing fruit. Father, I don't think there's anybody in this room that would say out loud that with all the struggles that we go through, if we know that they're going to cause us to be more like you, Lord, that we would say, Lord, I don't want to go through those things. 
Lord, as a follower of Jesus, we want to be like you. And God, you've told us that as we're connected to you, we will bear much fruit. But apart from me, from you, we, we can do nothing. And Father, I pray for those who are here today who are apart. God, today that you would draw, your, draw them to yourself, God, that they would know you in a, in a real and a personal way. Lord, for salvation, for growth, Lord, for sanity. Father, you are the hope that we are looking for. And Lord, today, God, I pray that you would show us exactly who you are as we know you deeper, as we know you personally, as we know you daily. And God, we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Isaiah 45, 22, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. Would you stand together? Let's, um, let's sing together just this restatement of a beautiful hymn of our faith, and let's turn our eyes upon Jesus. Lift your voice with us.
Jesus this morning, we turn our eyes to you, the one and only, the, the Savior. God, I thank you that you grant us truth in your word, that we know that this morning in the midst of all the competing affections, all the other things that say, look at me, God, your word declares, turn to Christ, mm. who will save us. God, we turn to you now. Pray, Father, that you would do a work in our midst through your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It was during the 1970s that the U.S., the United States, was engaged what is now infamously known as the Cold War with the nation of Russia. We're there for quite a few years. But the threat of nuclear war during that time was at an all-time high. And so response to that threat of war, the United States Department of Defense invested billions of dollars in what was called a global positioning system that would allow us to better navigate uh, our submarines at the time. And this was very important strategy because precise navigations of these submarines would enable the United States to get an accurate fix of the positions of those submarines in case of a ballistic missile launch. But in 1983, President Ronald Reagan announced that this system that the government had invested billions of dollars in was now going to be available to United States civilians all across our land. And today we call it GPS, right? GPS. So now what you can do is that you can pull out your smartphone and you can open up the Maps app. You can type the word pizza into your phone and immediately orange dots begin to pop up on your map. And you can push those little orange buttons or on your phone and it will take you turn by turn to the hottest and the freshest pizza that you can now eat. I don't know about you, but that's some of the best money the U.S. government has ever spent right there, right? But just think about it. What did we do before GPS? How did we get anywhere? What did we do? Now that we just do is we get into our vehicles, we punch in the address, and there we go. Turn by turn directions are there for us. We don't even have to think anymore. Somebody says turn right, somebody says turn left, and then we get to our destination. Now, before GPS, what would we do? Well, we'd pull out old Rand McNally. You had not heard that one in a while, have you? Some of you are younger saying, well, who's Rand McNally? Well, Rand McNally used to make maps, and there was those maps that were about this big that you'd curl up, usually most folks had, and it was shoved under the seat of your car. And by the time you've used it two or three times, the cover is completely off of it, but the maps are still there. Or if you were real sophisticated and highfalutin, when the internet first got popular, you could contact AAA and they would print out the directions for you, put it in a spiral bound and mail it to you before you go on your trip to tell you every stop you needed to make, where the gas stations were and all that kind of thing. We don't do any of that anymore. But today, one of the least favorite things that I like to hear my maps app tell me is summed up in one word recalculating <laughs> recalculating you know that that's really apple code in the nicest way possible saying hey dummy you're driving in the complete opposite direction that you need to go to and if you don't turn around soon things are going to be bad right i mean you can't just make the block anymore right guys you just can't do that that's an inside joke with my Louisiana crew from last weekend. But here's, amen. <laughs> but here's the thing about destinations. You ready? You will never arrive at your destination if you're going the wrong way. You'll never arrive at your destination if you're going the wrong way. No matter how determined we are as dads or as husbands, 
we can, we can be determined and all of those things there. If, if you want to go on a trip, you've got to be traveling in the right direction. Traveling in the wrong direction will never get you where you need to be. Now, the same is true spiritually. Christianity is in very much in line with this navigational truth. And I'm, I'm afraid that as we sit here and as we gather in churches all across North America this morning on a Sunday like this, that there are untold thousands, if not millions of people who have started out heading in the wrong direction. And no matter how sincere we may be, no matter how properly motivated we may be, they're never going to arrive at their desired destination. And last Sunday, we began our series called The Centered Life. And, and what we are doing as a family of faith is digging deep into some of these foundational truths concerning what it looks like to center our lives on Jesus Christ. How do we follow him? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? And as we laid out last week, last Sunday, here are some important things, some key principles. The centered life is all about relationships. And last week, I unpacked for us three primary relationships. The first of all is the, is the centered life is about our relationship with God. And we use the word no. Know God personally and daily. Everything else regarding centering our lives on Jesus is rooted here. I'm to first and to foremost be in a love relationship with God through Jesus Christ where I personally and daily know him. Secondly, my relationship with God then spills into a word we call live. Because I have a relationship with God, I now have a relationship with God's family. Because God is my father, we are now brothers and sisters in Christ in the same family. So following Jesus is first and foremost about a personal love relationship with God that's daily and intimate and personal. But it spills into a relationship as we live out that relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ called the church. But then there's also a third relationship. It's about a relationship with those who don't know God at all. We use the word share, that we are to share the good news of Jesus both near and far. We are to take part in God's mission of taking the message of the gospel to people who don't know God both locally but also globally. So following Jesus at its core is about these three things. Following Jesus is all about a love relationship with God that overflows into fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ and then overflows into a relationship with people who don't know God at all. That is the centered life. But what we've done is that we've complicated some things. We've complicated things with rules and regulations do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs, systems and ceremonies. But at its core, the simplicity of the gospel is a relationship with God, a relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ and our relationship with the world. If that is our destination, if that is where we're headed, if that's what we're aiming at, living our lives to follow Jesus through these relationships, where's the blessed place in the Bible for us to make sure we started in the right direction? Well, I think the best place to go is at the beginning where we see the very first followers of Jesus being called. And so if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to be primarily in Mark chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 this morning. And so I want to kind of give you some context of what's happening in this verse before we get there. Jesus has gone up on the mountain, and Jesus is about to call these first disciples, these first followers. So Jesus goes up on the mountain. Now, Mark doesn't give us this de detail, but Luke gives us the detail that Jesus prayed all that night before with the Father. He spent time with the Father before he called these disciples. And so here's what Mark writes. He says, and they went up on the mountain and, and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him. And he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach. Now, what we're going to do this morning and even next week is that we're going to dig into this principle of no. 
We're going to unpack some truths and some principles about our relationship with God, what it's supposed to, to look like. Then we're going to spend a few weeks doing the same thing with the other two relationships that I've already mentioned. But this weekend, I want us to focus on our relationship with God, and I want to give you three truths this morning about the centered life. You ready? Here's the first truth. The centered life begins with an invitation. The centered life begins with an invitation. We read here in these verses about Jesus calling his first 12 disciples. It's his invitation for them to follow him. And look what he says there in verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and he called to him those whom he desired. Now, if you don't know this, the, the New Testament was originally written in what is called Kine Greek, the common Greek. And in the Greek language, one of the uniquenesses about the language is that the verbs are just pregnant with meaning. There's so much meaning often packed into them, like the word that we've translated called here. Some of your translations may even say summoned there. It's a Greek verb that's filled with significant meaning. It's a word that literally means to invite to oneself. Now, there's a, there's a, there is a Greek word that simply means to call or to invite or to extend an invitation. But this particular verb is a compound word. It doesn't just talk about an invitation to someone or something, but it's literally an invitation to oneself. Every aspect of this word stresses that the invitation of Jesus was not to a destination, but the relationship with a person. Jesus invites them to himself. And you see the invitation to follow Jesus is not an invitation here to a religion. It's not a system of do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs, rules and regulations. The invitation to follow Jesus is not a, even an invitation to get involved in church it's not an invitation to just simply more moral activity. It's not an invitation simply just to go to heaven when you die. Now, going to heaven, listen to me, going to heaven when you die is an awesome part of the package. Amen? Right? Y'all did a little better than the 8 o'clock service. They didn't act like they wanted to go to heaven, right? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die, right? It's a great thing, but, but what makes heaven heaven is the fact that's where Jesus is. And when I get to heaven, I'm taking my relationship that I now have by faith to an entirely new level where that relationship is no longer by faith. Now that relationship is now by sight because the Bible says we will see him just as he is. You see, the invitation of Jesus is to enjoy a relationship with the God of heaven who made you through the person of Jesus Christ. He invited them to follow him. But I also wanted you to see that he invited them to follow him because it says that he desired them. God invited these men into a relationship with himself because he desired to have a relationship with them. This is the, the very first time that Jesus has ever called anyone to himself. And he said he invited them to himself because he desired them. Can you imagine how these 12 guys felt for just a moment? Here were these men who had grown up as Hebrew children. They had grown up in the Jewish faith. They had grown up believing the promises of God, that God was going to send a Messiah and, when, and they understood from the Old Testament prophecies that when the this Messiah is to come, he was going to be God in the flesh. And for all their lives, they had been raised with this story, what, with this promise that, that God loves you. God's going to send a Messiah. This Messiah is going to save you. He's going to be God in the flesh. He is going to come to us. He is Emmanuel and, and dwell among us. And now, here they are, after years and years and years of hearing this, and they come face to face with Jesus Christ. And they discover this is, this is the one they've been talking about. This is the one that they promised it was going to come. This is Emmanuel. This is God with us. And, and here's what, the, what he says to us. Hey, guys, 
Let me tell you why I've come. I've come to invite you to know me. I've come to invite you into a relationship with me. And let me tell you why I'm doing that. Because I desire a relationship with you. And when I hear that, the only thing you say is, wow, oh my goodness. How much must that have just knocked them back to realize that the whole plan of redemption, the whole promise of the Messiah was because God wanted to know us, to love him, and to be known and loved by him. Look what the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires... There's that word again. It's the same word we see there in Mark 3. All people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And here's what that means. God desires for every human being to be in a loving relationship with himself. So God made us to know him. And God's desire for every one of us is that you would have a personal love relationship with him. Here's what that verse means. God desires a relationship with you even more than you desire a relationship with him. Chew on that for a second. God desires a relationship with you even more than you desire a relationship with him. If that don't get somebody excited this morning, we're all asleep. The God who created everything that you can see, everything that you can taste, touch, feel, or smell. God who sits on the throne of the universe. God who has always been and always will be. God who is infinite and beyond anything that we can comprehend. God desires a relationship with you even more than you could desire a relationship with him. Here's why. Because he loves you. Listen, I don't know what you came in here carrying today, but hear me very carefully. The whole message of this book to us, the Bible, is that God loves you, and because he loves you, he desires a relationship with you. God does not love us because we are lovable. Have you looked in the mirror lately? I'm talking to myself. I wouldn't be talking to you. And I can, I can prove that to you. He made the choice to send his son even before you were you. You didn't even have a chance to earn it yet. And if you want to, to get really theological about it, the Bible says that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. That means that before any of you were ever you, he already decided to love you. <clears throat> that get anybody excited in this room? And in eternity past, he established a plan to redeem you to himself because God loves you so much. He wants a relationship with you. God loves you right where you are, right here. You're, wherever you're sitting, exactly who you are, God loves you. Listen, here's where the story of the gospel plays out. You, you see where the problem begins here. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. That word iniquity that we see there in that verse is a, one of the four uh, Hebrew words that we have for the word sin in the Old Testament. And it's a word that means a conscious, deliberate wrongdoing. Your iniquities, your sin has made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. And I know what you're thinking. See there, pastor? I told you God doesn't love me. Look at what my sin has done. No, God loves us despite our sin. Let me show you again what we read just a moment ago in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God, and there is one, what's that word? Mediator. What, what is a mediator? A mediator is somebody who comes between two people who are opposed and reconciles them, brings them back together into a relationship. Something has broken the relationship and the, in the relationship and the mediator comes and reconciles that relationship and puts it back together. 
For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And so here's the reality. God created you and me to know him and to love him and to live our lives in fellowship with him more than anything else in your life. God desires a relationship with you. But because of our sin, we were separated from God because God is holy. But God loves us so much that he took care of our sin problem and sent his son Jesus as the mediator. Christ stepped in and took all of our sin on himself. He died on the cross, rose again from the dead, and now Christ lives to reconcile us to God. Because of Jesus, you and I can be given a relationship with God. Religion says you got to do this, this, and this to, to earn that. Religion says the only way that you ever get a relationship with God is that you do all the right things and you don't do all the wrong things. And at the end, you just hope when you stand before God and those scales begin to teeter back and forth, as you hold your breath, God says, well, you did the best you could, just come on in. That's what we're hoping for. But that's not true. That's not what Christianity says. Christianity says there's nothing, nothing. Do we understand that word? Nothing we could do. But God did it anyway because he loved us. And he gave his son and he's reconciled us back into a relationship with himself. But don't miss this. His invitation had to be accepted Look back at what it says in Mark chapter 3, verse 13. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those who he desired. What are those next words? And they came to him. Again, God is not going to force you into a relationship. He simply invites you into a relationship. And I love the fact that this word that they came to him, it means that that, that means that they set off into a journey. I love that because, you see, getting saved is not a decision that, that, that happens in a, a moment and then it's over with. Getting saved is, is step one on a journey that will carry you all the way through life into all eternity. This relationship must be accepted. And if you miss this, you miss everything. You see, being around Christianity and being a Christian is not the same thing. It's not. Do you have a personal relationship with God? I'm not asking you if you do the right things or, or not do the wrong things. You've been to church lately, reading your Bible, trying to be a good person. Do you have a relationship with God? And if your response is, well, I'm trying, I'm working on it, I, I, I'm getting better. If you start out that direction, you're no, never going to arrive at the destination that you were designed for. Let me show you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. It says, on that day. Now, what day is Jesus talking about here? That's the day coming at the end of the world when, when all that we know as earth and the world comes to an end. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? Do you hear it? Lord, we did all the right stuff. And they came up with a list. Man, it's super spiritual. Man, it sounds really good. They were performing miracles. They were casting out demons, prophesying. Lord, we went to church every weekend. Lord, did we not tithe? Lord, did we not pray? Did we not read our Bible? Lord, did we not try to be good people? Then look what he says. Scratches their dreams. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Did you not just hear what we were practicing, Lord? How can that be called lawlessness? And here's what I say. And I believe this is what Jesus was teaching us. Any activity that's not Christ in me, out of the overflow of my relationship with him, is not pleasing to the Father. 
no matter how spiritual you package it. So, before we go any further this morning, I want to stop right here for just a second. And we can't move past this without stopping for a moment. Notice the word new there in Matthew 7, 23. It's the same word that we used in John chapter 17, verse 3 last week when it says, and this is eternal life, that they know you. It's the same word. It implies personal fellowship. Here's what Jesus said. You were doing all of that stuff, but you had no relationship with me. You can start doing all of this, but if you miss this, you miss everything. So I want to ask you right now, where you're sitting right now, everybody in this room, I'd ask you to bow your head for just a moment. And if you're here today and you already know Jesus, here's what I'm asking you to do. You just start praying for people in this room. Pray for the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God right now. Just pray. And if you're here today, here's the question. Do you know God? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Have you ever come to the place in your life where you've turned from your sin and believed on Jesus? Have you trusted Christ? I'm not asking you this morning if you're a religious person. I'm not asking you if you've ever been baptized. I'm not asking you if you read your Bible. Listen, all those things have their place, but none of them means anything apart from the relationship with God. Do you know God? And then you ask, well, how do you come to know God? Will you simply accept his invitation? You believe on Jesus right where you're sitting, right there in your seat. You can cry out to God. You can say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you love me. I know that you died and rose again for me. And right now, Jesus, I surrender the control of my life to you. I believe in you. I turn from my sin and I embrace Christ. And if you just prayed that with me for the very first time and you gave your life to Jesus, let me be the first to say to you, welcome to the family of God. Now I want everyone to look this way. In a little bit, we're going to get to the end. And I know some of you are disappointed that I'm not at the end yet. But we're going to get to the end in just a moment. And in just a few minutes, when we do, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song of worship. And when we stand and we sing that song of worship, some people will be coming to these altars and they'll be praying. That's what God's leading them to do. And if you just prayed that prayer with me for the very first time and you gave your life to Jesus, or you've realized today that's what, that's what you want to do, when we stand, I'm going to be down here in the front like I am every Sunday. And here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to leave your seat, and I want you to come right down here, and I want you to say, I'm giving my life to Jesus. I'd love to pray for you. I'd love to be able to sit down with you and talk. You didn't just make a decision. You just began a journey. And we want to walk with you on this journey. And if that makes sense, say amen. Amen. Well, let's move on to statement number two. The next two are not as long as that one, but we had to build the foundation. Here's statement number two. The centered life is all about intimacy. Again, Mark chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. And he went up on the mountain, and he called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him, and he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they. Now, we're going to stop right there. You say, why do we stop right there? Why is that such a big deal? Here's why. Because in the Greek language, those three little words, so that they, are one word in the original language. And it's one word that's blinking a light at us, saying, hey, you got to slow down. You got you to look here, okay? Here's the reason why. Jesus invited them into a relationship with himself. They responded and they came to him. And then the Bible says he appointed them and set them apart. And here's the reason why. Here's the reason why. So that they might be with him. And you're saying, like me, at one time in my life, wait a minute. That's supposed to say to live for him. Right? 
He invited them into a relationship with himself. He set them apart so they could live for him. I've given my life to Christ now. It's my responsibility now to, to live for him. He said, I love you. I brought you into a relationship with myself. I've invited you here. I'm setting you apart. And here's why. So you can be with him. If you ask the average Christian, what's the goal of the Christian life? Most Christians would say something like, to live for God. You ever heard anybody say that? Maybe you've even said that yourself. It sounds really spiritual. Here's what they say. God has done so much for me, now I want to do something great for God. The problem with that statement is it's, it's wrong. God didn't invite you to do something great for him. Some people say, well, well, here's the goal. The goal is to obey him. And we're going to talk more about that next week, but, but we can't, we've got to stop here and, and talk about obedience. You, when we talk about obedience, you know what happens? Obedience then becomes the focus of my life. Obedience is never to be the focus of my life. Intimacy with God should be the focus of my life. If obedience is the focus of your life, how's that working out for you? The goal of the Christian life is to be with him. Jesus didn't say he invited them so, he could, so they could live for him. He said so that they would be with him, meaning this. Following Jesus is not about doing. Following Jesus is about being. We had great discussion about this in our Sunday school class this morning. Philippians chapter 3 is full of this imagery. And when this first hit me, I'm just telling you, it rocked my world. Let me show you a life-changing principle that's transformed my life. And I hope it brings you the same freedom that it brings me. The primary call on my life is not to do something for Jesus. The primary call on my life is to be with Jesus. And when I hear that, I want to go all William Wilberforce. Freedom! Freedom! Minus the face paint. You shall know the truth and the truth will, will make you free. The primary call of my life is not to do something for Jesus. The primary call on my life is to be with Jesus. And here's what that means. The goal is the relationship. Simply that. What happens is that we view the relationship as the starting line that we just kind of step over. Okay, now I've got my relationship with God. Now let's move on to step B. No, the goal is the relationship. We're so worried about doing, we miss the being. Remember, we looked at this last week. Put it back up there, John 17, verse 3. And this is eternal life, that I do good works for you. Is that what it says? That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have since. This little verse gives us the simplest summary of the Christian life. And so I, I want to summarize the entire Christian life for you with, with two goals. Are you ready this morning? Here are the two goals. It's the big picture. First of all, it's the big picture. It's the overall goal. Here it is, to know God. That's the target. At the end of the day, that's what I am aiming at. God has invited us into a love relationship with himself so that I can know him. This is eternal life, that they may know you. There's the big goal, to know God. So if there is a big goal, there's got to be a daily goal, right? Here's the daily goal, to spend time with God. That's it. The overall goal is to know God. The daily goal is to spend time with God. Now, the most difficult thing as a follower of Jesus, the most difficult practice of a follower of Jesus Christ on a daily basis is what? Spending time with God. It's the hardest thing. And let me tell you why. The enemy knows the deal. He doesn't care how many hours a week you spend doing as long as you're not being 
Because doing is not what Scripture says is pleasing to the Father. Only what happens out of the overflow of being, the only thing of significance that happens out of my life, happens out of the overflow of intimacy with God. Because apart from Him, I can't do nothing. Now, later, we're going to look at what, how shaping, how that shapes uh, our being, shapes our doing. We're going to look at those things later on down the road. But intimacy with God is what we've been invited into. And we have substituted intimacy with God for everything under the sun. And that's why Paul, I believe, where we started last week in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, says, I'm afraid that your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So having my life centered on Jesus overflows into every area of my life. And so let me show it to you again. Mark chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. And he went up on the mountain, and he called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. Now, when most of us think about preaching... You probably think about what I am doing right now or attempting to do right now. But the word preach is a word that literally means to, to make public. And here's what Jesus said. Here's your responsibility. You be with me and here's what I'll do. I'll make your life public, my life public through you. Out of the overflow of just being with me there develops a spontaneous overflow of the life of Christ through us. Again, Christianity is not living for him. Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He rose again from the dead. Why? Because now he lives. You see, his death is not just my death. His life is now my life. Christ now lives in me and through me out of the overflow of an intimate relationship with him. And so here's statement number three. It's the longest of the three. Everything Jesus desires to do through, he will accomplish out of the overflow of his relationship with you. Which means, if I want to get in on the great things God can do through my life, I must be with him. You got to be with him. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that being with Jesus doesn't change the way that I live. I'm not saying it doesn't produce obedience in my life. I'm just asking. What's the focus of our lives? Not until we are broken to the point of realizing apart from him, I can do nothing, will we experience the greatness of God in our life. The big goal of our lives as Christians is to know God. And our daily goal is to spend time alone with God. Everything God wants to do through you, he will do out of the overflow of that relationship. And as we look at the life of Jesus... In the Gospels. That's how he lived. Everything that he did, he did out of the overflow of intimacy with the Father, even to the point where Jesus said himself, You see my works? It's not my works, it's the it's the Father working in me. He modeled this for us. So I ask you this morning, do you desire to see God do something beyond your wildest imagination? We can miss it. We can miss it because we're too busy doing something for him and not being with him. The centered life is all about relationships. And that relationship, first of all, with God begins with an invitation. It's all about intimacy, just being with him. And then everything he desires to do through your life, he will accomplish out of the overflow. And so I ask you this morning clearly. What is he doing in your life today? Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the directness of your word. Father, I also thank you for even the simplicity of your word at times. And God, this morning as we come to this crucial moment, and God, I know that through the, through the Holy Spirit, Lord, you are working in our hearts this morning. God, you're doing things in people's lives, Lord, that are beyond our imagination. God, you are drawing some to yourself. 
And Father, my prayer is that this morning that we would be sensitive to your spirit, to where your spirit leads us. And God, if there's someone here who's never trusted you, that today would be their day of salvation. But Father, for us as a believer, as your followers, Father, my prayer is that today that we would desire to be with you. God, we know that it all begins with an invitation. But Lord, our goal is the relationship to be with you. And Father, we know that everything that you desire through our life, you're going to accomplish out of an overflow relationship with you. And so this morning, Lord, we want to be available. Father, we want to be teachable. Lord, we want to be honest with ourselves. We want to be honest with you. Father, I pray that you move in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. So friends, if you're here today and you've answered that invitation, maybe earlier or even right now, you want to answer that invitation. That relationship with God begins with an invitation and Jesus says, I desire to be with you. I want you to be with me. But if you have already accepted that invitation, understand this, that that relationship is all about intimacy, knowing God personally, knowing him daily. And so where are you today? Have you been so busy doing that you forgot about being with Jesus? Yes, being with Jesus shapes our doing, and we're going to talk more about that in the days ahead. But this morning, we've got to start there, the foundation of being with him and understanding that everything that God wants to do in and through you, he does it at the beginning with that relationship. And maybe it is this morning on these altars, there's something that you've placed in your life that's, that's good, but you've replaced those things, those idols, for being with Jesus. It's a lot of things that we could put there that are good, but they're not what God called us to do. So maybe God's convicting you this morning through the Holy Spirit, Lord. I, 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 just, I just hope that you'll have the freedom to be able to come and to, to lay those things before the Lord. And again, I'll be standing here if you want to accept that invitation. That invitation is open. Let's stand together and let's sing this morning. Amen. Glad that you're here with us. If you're on the floor, there's a connection card in the pew rack in front of you. Your guests with us. I ask you to fill that out. And if you will fill that out and take it to the atrium out here to our, our guest desk, we will trade this card for a gift for you. So we want to ask you to do that. If you're in the balcony, these connection cards are on a uh, table in the foyer. We don't have pew racks up there, so they're down here in the foyer. We'd ask you to do that. And if you haven't had a chance to worship through giving this morning, you can do that by placing that offering in one of our offering boxes. This afternoon, full slate of activities. If you grab your bulletin, uh, you will do really well. 
and being able to follow alongside of those. And so we're going to take about a three-minute break and jump into our first family meeting, but I want to pray for us before we're dismissed. Father, thank you, God, that you love us. And Father, that you invite us into a relationship with yourself. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you give us access to the throne of grace so that we can have that intimacy with you to know you to be known by you and to be loved by you. And God, we thank you for that. And Father, I pray that as we seek to be intimate with you and to know you, Lord, that you would live your life in and through us because we know as your word tells us that apart from you, we can do nothing. So Lord, we abide in you this morning. We abide in you for all times. God, we praise you and thank you for all that you're doing in the life of this church. Father, how you're changing lives. And God, as we go into our time of business, God, I pray your protection upon us and wisdom as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.